I can see Surtax here. So uh, welcome, welcome to the show. Hey, Sophia. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm all good. I'm all good in here. The summer is here. Uh, we're trying to enjoy the most of it, but we'll see. Yeah. So where whereabouts are you at the moment? Uh, I'm in Turkey right now, a city called Izmir. Uh, it is a very uh, sunny place, um, but we're not able to enjoy the most of the summer right now, but hopefully things will get better and yeah. we'll get back to enjoying our summer soon. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure the weather's glorious. It must be a shame to be stuck inside at <laughs> <Yeah>. the moment. <laughs> yeah, but uh, thank you so much for being with us in what, what must be your early afternoon, I suppose, is it? Or is it late afternoon there? It's late, it's late it? afternoon. Late yeah. afternoon, exactly. yeah. Yeah, so no, thank you for joining us and uh, hopefully you're ready. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to the talk and learning more about, you know, how you grew your brand and your, your game, basically. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, thank so, you yeah. very much. Right. And, uh, and yeah, to everyone else, pop those questions in and I, I'll see you at the end of your talk uh, for some Q&A. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Good, thanks. So let me just share my screen before I start my presentation. So I'm hoping that everyone can see my screen. So today I'm going to be talking about um, how Headball 2 became a multi-million dollar game on a monthly basis. So before I get into the details, I want to walk you through about the content of my presentation. So I'll just briefly talk about who am I, uh, who is Masomo, and then give some details about the game concept of Headball. And then um, since we released Headball 1, I'll be sharing uh, some high level numbers of what we achieved with it and then what we failed at. And based on those learnings, what we wanted to achieve with Headball 2 and then how did we achieve our goals so at the end of the presentation, if we have time, I'll be happy to answer your questions. So um, as a, um, so I started actually uh, in free to play mobile games business in 2011 at EA as a product manager and then moved on to Zynga as a lead product manager. And then I uh, worked at Perfect World as director of product, uh, responsible, mainly responsible from the global expansion of the company. And then um, later on, I worked at Tilting Point as game director and now um, currently I am working at Masomo as a VP of product. And then when it comes to Masomo, we are founded in 2015. Uh, we are based in Izmir, Turkey. And then we have around like 80 employees. It's a pretty young studio actually. Our average employee age is around like 29 years old. Um, we were acquired by Miniclip in March, 2019. We do all development and production in house. And finally, we are a profitable company for now. And then I will give you some information about the game concept of Headball. So Headball is basically a um, PVP focused, real time multiplayer casual football game. It is available on iOS and Android and it is using free to play as the business model. So while you are playing the game, you need to do three things to increase your win ratio or be successful in the game. First of all, you should be definitely playing the game and improve your skills because it's at the end of the day, it's a skill-based game. And number two, you should be collecting like better characters throughout the game. Each and every character has their own attributes and look. And finally, during the matches, you can uh, use superpowers to take advantage against your opponent. We have superpowers like giant um, uh, character, for example, while you are playing the game, you can use that superpower and your character becomes huge. So it is easier for you to score goals against your opponent, or you can use freeze superpower. So in the middle of the match, you can freeze your opponent and then you can easily score goals. So every match is 90 seconds and whoever scores the most number of goals wins the match. So that is basically a very high level view of headball as a game concept. And um, when we released Headball 1 in 2015, we have got a total of 40 million players in its life cycle. And 70% of these installs were organic. And it was, we were very lucky that actually the gro growth was mainly uh, thanks to our organic installs. And then we, have, uh, we had an average of around 1 million daily active users. And then we have 55% day one retention and 20% day seven retention, which is actually quite uh, okay when you look at the industry standards. So, so far we were actually having some good numbers, but when it comes to our LTV, we had super low LTV. So it was super low that we were not able to grow the game through a paid UA, especially in like tier one countries. So with Headball 2, what we wanted to achieve was actually, we wanna still continue our organic growth, 
still maintain seven digit uh, more than a million daily active user base and keep on having the same retention numbers, if not better. And most importantly, at the end of the day, we wanted to increase our LTV. So while we were thinking about all these uh, things, actually, the competition in the market was growing super fast. So based on the app any data, there are like millions of games released on Google Play and App Store, but only around like 2,000 of them were generating around 5 million US dollars of annual revenue. So for us to be part of one of those companies, we had to increase our LTV so that we can be in the league of game companies who are making more than 5 million on an annual base. So to increase LTV, you can actually think of a lot of different uh, stuff, but when it comes to our case, we wanted to list actually um, only the three uh, major things that had a higher LTV impact. So the first one is, um, if you want to have a higher LTV, you're, you need to have actually a monetization on live ops friendly core loop and meta game. And the second component is having a flexible live ops system. And the third component is processing of big data. So let's just start with the first item, uh, monetization on live ops friendly core loop and meta game. So when you look at headball core loop, it is a pretty basic one actually. You play matches and get some resources you spent those resources to get better characters and power-ups, and then you spent those to uh, increase in the leagues and then be the best player in the game. So we did not really want to change the core loop from headball one to headball two because it was working fine, but we wanted to challenge the core loop and our meta game in two ways. The first one is if we can actually achieve a scalable, uh, core loop and meta game in the long term for both better late game retention and monetization. That was the first area that we were challenging, challenging our core loop and meta game. And the second thing was um, if our core loop and meta game is live ops friendly or not. So to achieve those two areas, actually, we had to make some significant changes in the game. So regarding the part where if it is a scalable uh, core loop or meta game part, we did some significant changes in the game when it comes to headball too. So the first biggest change that we have done was getting the characters. So in headball one, if you want to get the characters, it was pretty straightforward actually. If you go to the market in the game and then all characters have a price tag and then you spend that currency to get those characters. So when you look at the advantages of this kind of model is that it's very easy for players to understand and could be a good reason why the retention is so good. But when it comes to downsides, it was lacking the monetization depth, and then it was super vulnerable against the economy inflations, especially in the late game. So we were seeing that actually, no matter what we do, um, we were not able to actually price the things in a balanced way because at the end of the game life cycle, players were getting collecting a lot of coins, and the moment they were more likely to spend more money into our game because they were engaged players, they were not spending anything because they were able to get those characters very cheap, actually. So getting those characters in Headball 1 had its own problems. When it comes to um, Headball 2, um, we changed actually the way players are able to get those characters. So first of all, we removed the price tag, and then players actually had to um, collect the cards to unlock those characters. And to collect those cards, you need to open card packages. So basically, we have introduced gacha mechanic into our game. When you look at the advantages of this kind of mechanic, it definitely has like um, higher monetization potential at a very high level. Um, but on the downside, it could be potentially harder for our target audience to understand how we can get those cards and et cetera. And th therefore, it could be definitely a retention killer. So, but no matter what, we made that change and then we took those risks. So after you acquire those characters, you unlock those characters in Headball 1, you were not able to upgrade them, which results in you spend some money into those characters and that's it. You don't have to make any additional investment to that existing character that you had. But in Headball 2, we have introduced character depth and we have introduced the upgrade system into the game. 
So each upgrade giving players and characters meaningful benefits. So when you upgrade the characters, your attributes actually increase, characters become better. And then you also unlock additional skill slots, which you can actually embed additional skill cards to make your characters look even better in terms of uh, the attributes and additional um, benefits. And finally, when you max out your characters, when you upgrade them to the latest level, um, you were able to unlock new skins to have a unique look and feel. So after we make all these changes, like how you acquire the characters and increase the depth of the characters, we are thinking that we are able to achieve a scalable core loop and metagame in the long term. But what about the live ops friendliness? So after we introduced the gacha mechanic in the game, it, we actually made the life of, player, life of the players quite hard because gacha mechanic is sometimes an annoying mechanic and it requires more time and money investment when compared to the mechanic that we were using in Headball 1. So we made players' life is difficult, more difficult, but thanks that we have live ops to make their lives easier. So when you participate in the limited time events, we were given away the things that the players were needing, such as character card packages or the characters directly itself. So it was adding the, uh, it was creating an additional value to live ops, limited time events, because it was making the players' lives much more easy. And on top of that, we were uh, offering personalized bundles in the game so that whenever you want to have a specific character in the game, you can actually benefit from those bundles and then make your life easier. So long story short, we wanted to create an illusion where if you don't participate in those live ops events, things would be really hard for you. But we were all the time introducing shortcuts in the game through our live ops so that their life can actually become easier. So that is why um, live ops is a fundamental part of our core loop currently in Headball 2. You don't have to engage with it, but if you engage, you are going to get the benefit of it uh, pretty significantly. So that was the first part, uh, having a uh, core loop and metagame that is monetization and live ops friendly. The second component is having a flexible live ops system. So when we say live ops, I define live ops as the art of keeping the game fresh for all segments of players in a personalized way. So I actually um, highlighted in bold letters three words in this one on purpose, because those three words actually define the evolution of live ops in free-to-play um, gaming. Back in the days, in years, live ops main purpose was to keep the game fresh, and that was it. But after some time, we all realized that actually keep, we should be able to keep the game fresh in a different way, in a different strategy way for different types of segments of players. But those differentiation by segments is not enough right now and in the future. So we have to actually take this game beyond that. And that is why we have started using personalization on top of segmentation in our live ops. And I will explain later on what that means. So if you look at our live ops infrastructure, we use live ops uh, for mainly three things, game config updates, limited time in-game events management, and sales, bundles, store merchandising. And on top of our, uh, we built our infrastructure on top of a pretty advanced segmentation and personalization system. And our whole system is in-house built. So regarding the first part, game config updates, so to define the scope of game config updates through live ops, we need to define the core pillars of our game. So when you look at the core pillars of Headball 2, at the fundamental, uh, we have our matchmaking system. So matchmaking should be able to create exciting and competitive matches, but at the same time, motivate non-payers become payers, and also making sure that payers don't regret their purchase decision. Headball 2 is a skill-based game, but at the same time, it has pay-to-win elements in it. And the second level of the pyramid, we should be working on um, game balancing efforts so that we should be able to uh, create a strong balance between efforts and rewards in the game 
and fine tune the progression mechanics in the game. And finally, we have to have pretty strong live ops offers to actually maximize the monetization potential of our game. So after we define the core pillars of our game, then we actually moved on what are the things that we should be fine tuning remotely through our live ops tool. So currently with our live ops tool, we are able to change the pricing in the game on the fly. We can change the progression and difficulty curves in the game again on the fly based on the data and player feedback. And we can do some changes on our matchmaking system. We can do like country-based optimizations because it's a real-time multiplayer game. We don't have a lot of CCU in, in all the countries and all regions. So we can actually make adjustments based on the CCU of those countries. And also we can make some adjustments during our matchmaking and prioritize quality over speed or speed over quality. And finally, we can fine tune the rewards in the game so that we can make changes necessary without client updates on the fly. So that was the game config updates we can do through our live ops tool. And when it comes to limited time in-game events, we have a lot of different types of limited time in-game events. Like this one, for example, we have personal milestones on leaderboard. You can uh, participate in those events, complete the conditions, and get beautiful rewards. And we couple those in-game events with event characters. So when you participate in those events, if you are using that special event character, you can actually progress faster than your opponents. So we showcase these event characters through our bundles in various sections in the game. So we use limited time events for both monetization improvement and retention engagement improvement. We have weekend tournaments that is enabled during weekends to increase the competition during the weekends with some special rewards. We have challenges based on real life matches. And then we have some spend events to create additional sync uh, opportunities in the game. So these are pretty much done with all the game um, companies or like games in the world, but we wanted to take this into the next level by personalization and segmentation. So we first released those events and then um, we applied those events to whole audience base. But after some time, we realized that actually not every player segment in the game has like the same capabilities of completing those events. So we realized that actually we should be uh, segmenting those events based on player levels. So we enable an event, but all of those events requirements and rewards are differing based on the player level. So you see one type of event, but there are actually six different events going on at the same time, um, depending on the um, player level segment. So after we did this, we have seen that we have increased our per DAU uh, match, number of matches by 30 to 35%. And we wanted to take actually the segmentation thing into the next level by personalization. So during our events, when you see like some rewards, those events, rewards are actually different for every player in the game. And we use some conditions to define those rewards in the game. So in the first uh, reward, you are seeing a skeleton guy. It might be something different uh, for some other player based on some conditions. And that was the limited time in-game events um, part. When it comes to sales and bundles and store merchandising, again, we have a lot of different bundle templates like this one, for example, we have mixed content bundle offers. We have uh, like comparison offers, leveraging price anchoring and behavioral economics. We have complete accessory sets for uh, bundles. And then we have increased chance of getting certain characters, limited time catch up packs, and finally, we have special offers that are dedicated for character upgrade. Just like our events, we also um, use segmentation. And then whenever we release bundles, we actually define the price and content of those bundles based on the country, engagement level, and et cetera. But based on uh, our learnings and findings, when you price those bundles for different countries, it actually yields the highest result. So we have different pricing strategies for tier one countries, tier two countries, and tier three countries to maximize the revenue potential out of those countries. And just like, again, our uh, limited time events, 
in our bundles, we also have offers that are personalized. So whenever you see a bundle, like in this example, in this one, um, the character that you are seeing is different for a different player based on some conditions. We use some conditions like, for example, put the highest uh, powerful character in the game as the bundle character. We can define different like parameters and then different types of characters are shown in these examples in these bundles. So that was the live ops infrastructure uh, that we built in our game. And then the final part of higher LTV component is the processing of big data. So the big data is all about understanding the player patterns and taking proactive actions. So back in the days, we had to use like offline um, Excel documents to analyze data. It was a painful process. And then we moved on to Redash for better visualization but it also had some like negative parts um, in it. So we had to move on different solutions. And currently we are using Admos and Tableau as our data analysis tools. So Admos is mainly used for our ad mediation plus the uh, high level KPI tracking. On Tableau, we are using the in-game economy tracking, a lot of detailed segmentation reports, uh, we are using Tableau. And that was the final part of higher LTV components. So um, just because things are getting more detailed, we had to actually um, change our, uh, increase our product team size. There were only three people in a product team in 2017, but right now we have 20 people in a product team. And by product team, what I mean is like product managers, game designers, live ops managers, data analysts, and et cetera. So it's, we had to increase our team size to actually uh, deep dive into the data and create different opportunities for different segments and segments of players. So after we did all those things, what did we achieve with Headball 2? So when you look at the organic growth, we were able to actually continue our organic growth. We had a total of 55 million installs so far, and still 70% of those installs are coming from organic sources. And then we were able to increase the average DAU size of our game. But most importantly, we increased the DAU ratio of tier one countries by 45% when compared to headball one. And when you look at the day one and day seven retention, we were still maintaining those retention numbers, even though we made the game more complex and more difficult for players. But thanks to our live ops uh, strategy, it actually balanced out um, the life, uh, balanced out the um, quality of life, quality of our player's life. And most importantly though, um, we were able to achieve a 5x increase in our LTV. This enabled us scale the game with paid UA in tier one countries because we are able to compete against our, com against our competitors with higher bids. And currently we are able to spend seven digit UA budgets on a monthly basis, thanks to the increase in our LTV. So just to summarize, the most important stuff that you should be doing in your game to increase your LTV, at least that's what happened in our case, you should have a monetization live ops friendly core loop and meta game, you should have a flexible live ops system, and finally, you should have a great understanding of how you can process the big data. So that was my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Hi, so it's like, well, thank you. Thank you for a, an awesome chat, an awesome talk, I should say. And we have got some questions, if, uh, if that's okay with you. So sure. the first question from Sai is, uh, did you try Chartio? Um, no, we didn't try. Okay, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's that one. Is there any reason why, or is it just, it wasn't on your radar, I suppose. Well, it wasn't on the radar, I would yeah. say. Um, like if it was, we could give it a try because we are actually very open to try and test like new stuff. Um, yeah. Because you never know what's gonna, how is it gonna yield. So we are pretty open to actually um, give it a try uh, for a lot of new platforms, new um, features actually. Okay, great. And the other question we've got is, um, well, another one popped in at the same time, but I'll start with the one I was asking. Uh, what is your ad revenue and AIP split? So that's a very good question. It is actually shifting very recently. 
Um, if you asked this question six or uh, eight months ago, I would say 50-50, but currently it is right now 75% in-app purchase, 25% um, um, in-app advertising. Yeah, okay, great. That's fantastic. Uh, and um, the other question that popped up as I was speaking is, is live ops so important for casual games, um, which are ad heavy? So yeah, it's for games that are ad heavy, how important is live ops? When compared to games that have like almost like 50 50 um, in app purchase and ad revenue monetization, I would say it is more important for them. For games that are like heavily based on um, ads, I would say it is less important. I'm not saying it's not important at all, but maybe the things that you should be doing with your live ops infrastructure, you can actually um, get away with a limited number of uh, features with your live ops tool uh, when compared to other like games that have like 50-50 uh, monetization model. It is still useful, it is still powerful, but the investment that it requires might be lower. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, and gosh, the questions keep coming as long as you've got time. I think we'll ask a few more. Yeah, but, uh, I got time. Yeah, no um, Ertem has asked, uh, what is the sweet spot in the number and complexity of live ops in order to not overwhelm the players? Well, we had um, really good um, actual learnings from that because um, we, back in the days, uh, overdone it. We actually bombarded the players with a lot of different event types every single day. And then what we realized that was actually in the short term, it was working out perfectly good. But in the middle and long term, it was actually uh, not working that great because the more events you have, the more rewards you are actually giving players. So yeah. it was actually inflating the economy and it was also reducing the perceived value of those events in the player's eyes. So that is why we realized that we were overdoing it and that is why we simplified the number of events that are live every single day. Yeah, and, um, and uh, gosh, we've got a few more, but we'll, we'll ask one or two more and then we'll uh, let you get off. But uh, someone's asked, uh, why do you use AdMost? Um, it compared to the likes of Iron Source, AppLovin, or Mopup, is there a reason why you picked AdMost? Well, uh, the thing is that they are offering a very boutique service, actually. Yeah. So they don't have a lot of clients. And then, based on my experience in the previous companies, also, um, if you are a startup, you are not all the time actually their top priority because yeah. there are like other big game companies who are spending like millions of dollars of budgets every single day. But Admos is a kind of actually a boutique um, experience they are serving for us. So that was the biggest reason we are actually wanted to um, go with them. They were taking really good care of us. And that is quite important if you are a company at this stage where you need a lot of help from those platforms. Yeah, and, and this next question um, that might actually relate in, in some way, but you know, is how do you ensure that your live ops team is not overwhelmed with too much analysis and data? That's a very good question also. And that was also one of the reasons we wanted to simplify our, our uh, live ops events. It's not from the player side only, but also on our side, like managing all these different uh, live ops events is quite time consuming. Yeah. So um, that is why we wanted to simplify it. And we have a lot of like templates where whenever an event is actually completed, we actually see the results of them step by step. Um, but we see the whole funnel of those events very easily. So that is definitely helping us reduce the time we spend on analyzing the data. Um, but at the same time, again, like I said, simplifying the things sometimes is more, uh, it's better than uh, overdoing the stuff. Yeah, and I'll ask one last question um, and then I'll let you get on your way. But because I think it's quite an interesting one, you know, based on your experiences. As, are there any tips for indies to start design, track and balance the in-game economy? Well, um, I would say uh, for them, um, like what I would recommend them is actually before they release their game, they can actually create very simple simulators uh, that can actually, you can input some stuff and then the output is actually the economy results. They can s develop very easy simulators um, to mimic like what might happen when you go out. Because what I have seen is that if you're an indie developer, 
you will not be able to get millions of installs on day one. So mm -hmm. the data that you will be collecting after you release your game will be very limited. So that is why I would start with creating a simulator first and then go live and then make sure that also before going live, I have all the economy tracking in place so that I can actually see all my sinks and sources so that I can uh, do some small tweaks very quickly uh, to balance the game. But it is really hard to say before you go out. Yeah, well, fantastic. Yeah, and I know there's more questions, but obviously you, everyone can continue the chat in the Discord area uh, where we've got specific channels for each and every track. So, you know, hopefully Absolutely. if you've got time, you can uh, check it out because I'm sure the people are going to want to continue the conversation in some way, sure. shape or form. But, I'll you know, thank, thank you for such a fascinating talk and, you know, for sparing your time and uh, coming over here. And I, I hope you, like all of us, get to sh spend some time in the sun at some point this year. So <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Hopefully. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you so me. much. Thanks. Cheers. Bye.